As policymakers debate when and how to reopen the state economies, public health officials continue to warn about the danger of moving too fast. Joining us now from Baltimore, Dr. Tom Inglesby, director of the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins University. Doctor, good to be with you again. Morning, Chris. Where are we uh, with the virus? Have we reached the peak? Are we on the downslope of the virus? And now that we see the number of deaths, over 53,000, almost 54,000 this morning, can you give us a sense of the range of, of how many deaths we may see uh, from this virus overall, depending on how careful we are in the, reo in the reopening? Yes, I would say that we are, you know, for, for lack of better words, maybe near the end of the beginning of this pandemic in this country. We have reached a plateau nationally at this point. I mean, trends can change over time, but at this point, we have a plateau in new cases per day. Unfortunately, it's a very high plateau. We still are seeing about 30,000 new cases of COVID-19 every day in the United States and still are seeing something on the order of 2,000 deaths per day. So we are not through out of the woods by any means in terms of this pandemic, but at least we've reached a, a kind of a stable number of new infections and the number of people who are dying from this illness. If you, and one, one last you know, point at on one that. point, oh, we ahead, were talking Chris. about, let, let me just say, at one point we were talking about models, one million people, then it was 100,000 people, then it was 60. Now we're already up to 53,000. So give me a sense of the number. Mm. I understand these are, these are predictions, but the, the number of fatalities we might see from this. So I think modelers are pretty reluctant to model way beyond a month or two out from now because of so many variables. If we change our social distancing policies and uh, depending on how well states get prepared for the easing into the reopening, that could change outcomes quite a bit. But the leading models at the moment predict anywhere from 58,000 deaths to 110,000 deaths in the next month in the United States. I think no one's really modeling beyond that. And really, it's going to depend on many things that are difficult to wrap up into a single number. All right, let me ask you one more question, trying to foresee the future. Vice President Pence gave a mm -hmm. timeline this week for when we're going to come out of this. Here he is. If you look at the trends today, uh, that I think by Memorial Day weekend, we will largely have uh, this uh, coronavirus epidemic behind us. Memorial Day weekend, doctor, is that realistic? Well, at this point, if you go state by state, uh, you see that about half of the country, in half of the country, the numbers are still rising day to day. And about another third of the country, there seems to be a leveling off. And only a minority of, in a minority of the country, the numbers are actually coming down day by day. And so I, I don't think it's likely that we will be at that position by Memorial Day. But even more importantly, wherever we are in the epidemic, this virus is going to be with us until we have a vaccine. So as we ease up on social distancing measures and economies begin to, to very carefully reopen, we are at risk of recurrence or re-spikes in the illness in the epidemic. So I think everyone needs to be aware that even as we're beginning to open up again, there is a, a clear chance of a rise in cases in states that are doing that. Let, let's talk about that because a number of states, as you know, are beginning to reopen spas, salons, gyms, even restaurants. Mm -hmm. uh, is that safe? For people, you know, you talk about a, a, a spa where people are giving massages, a, a salon where people are filing people's nails or cutting their hair. Is that safe for people to be that close at this point if they're wearing masks and gloves? I don't think it's going to be possible for anyone to say something is safe, you know, completely safe at this point because the virus is very transmissible between people and because some people don't have symptoms, at least either in the beginning of the illness or maybe even at all during their illness. But we can say some things are safer than others. 
and businesses that have small numbers of people are probably safer than businesses that have very large numbers of people and the closeness of the interaction that also is a factor so if people are going to be closely interacting they should be using personal protective equipment if that's available in their state um, and outdoors will be safer than indoors so there is a range of different there, there are going to be a range of different um, risks that businesses face and it's important for all businesses now to be trying to understand the risks and making plans for how to diminish the risks as best they can within their own business their own operations let, let me ask you a quick uh, direct question would you feel safe at this point getting a haircut uh, getting a massage if you and the person doing it were both wearing gloves and masks I think at this point in most places in the country with the rate of illness as it is, I, I don't think so. There may be some places where community, community transmission is so low and testing is so good that we have confidence that the risk is low. Um, but I'd say I would be cautious about doing that at this point. You, you talk about testing. I know one of the problems you have with the White House guidelines is that you think they failed to address the issues of, of testing and contact tracing. Here is President Trump on that this week. We're doing very well on testing. Uh, we've tested far more than anybody else anywhere in the world. Steve, uh, Fauci that we're just not there uh, yet. No, I don't agree with him on that. No, I think we're doing a great job on testing. We're averaging, averaging about 150,000 tests a day. Isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. And the reason why is because we're not testing a lot of the mild and moderate illness that isn't people who aren't sick enough to be in the hospital. And so all those people are not getting counted and they aren't necessarily having their contacts traced or told to uh, isolate in their own homes. So we're missing a lot of the illness in the country. Until we get that under control, we're going to continue to have lines of transmission that we can't see. And beyond that, many businesses are now really beginning to think about how the diagnostics might factor into their reopening plans. And we just don't have diagnostic testing available on large scale for businesses. We're still focused on diagnosing the sickest people, those in nursing homes, healthcare workers, which is completely appropriate. But there are a small fraction of the number of people that we're going to need to test to really find all the illness and to get the economy moving in the right direction again. I want to squeeze two more questions in here in the time we have left, Doctor. Uh, I want to ask you about another White House guideline, and that is a steady decline in the number of new cases over the course of two weeks. Uh, I want to put some stats on the screen. Oklahoma is coming down from its peak, but had a 26 percent increase in new cases in the last week. And it went over the course of the last week from it, the numbers jumped from a low of 29 new cases last Sunday to over 100 new cases just this past Thursday and Friday. Should a state with those kinds of numbers be reopening now? Again, I would be very uh, cautious about doing that. I think we've seen um, there's an example in, in the papers this morning about a, a state in Japan that reopened quickly in March after a few weeks of num lowish numbers. And uh, three weeks later, rebounded to the point where they have to now close their economy down again. So uh, I think it's going to be important to really go slowly for those states who do reopen. I think it should be done very carefully with a lot of monitoring of both hospitalization rate, ICU rate, death rates. So uh, at this point, only about five states in the country, to my count, have had two weeks of decline. So only about two weeks in the two states or five states rather in the country have met the gating criteria right. laid out by the White House. I got about uh, a minute left uh, for one final question. As you know, President Trump yeah. has come under fire over the last week or so, first for uh, advocating the use of hydroxychloroquine and then uh, later this week, uh, this week for talking about the possibility, speculating about the possibility of injecting disinfectant. Here he is on that. I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute. 
one minute, and is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? I know you want to stay away from politics, and I think it's clear that, that any kind of ingestion of a disinfectant is dangerous. But, but two quick questions. One, where are you at this point about the use of hydroxychloroquine? And two, how do we sort through all of the conflicting advice that we get? Uh, well, and to your first question, I think the, there needs to be more study of hydroxychloroquine. Two studies that have come out so far have suggested it is possibly more harmful than helpful and possibly dangerous. So I don't think anyone should be taking hydroxychloroquine unless they are in a randomized controlled trial that's being carefully studied. Uh, and the second point is that I think the, the most important thing now in terms of, of medicines and vaccines is to follow where medical leaders and scientific leaders guide us. They're doing the studies. These studies take time. These medicines can actually hurt people. So there is a harm uh, that could potentially right. happen if people take medicines that aren't studied. So it's important to follow the scientists. Dr. Inglesby, thank you. Thanks for joining us again and giving us your expert analysis. Please come back. Thanks so much.